Hello, everyone, and welcome to Scourge of War Waterloo, episode 12. Now, today is June 18th, 2017. It is the 202nd anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo, uh, and I guess also the Battle of Wavre, but that was a rather insignificant battle compared to Waterloo. So for the anniversary, we're going to take a look at a Waterloo scenario, and we are going to do the first divisional scenario in the game, which is uh, the King of Westphalia here. And it's a one-hour scenario, which is about average for a divisional scenario. Uh, now, in the last episode, it was a very quick one. It was only a 35-minute, and I made a point of mentioning that that was rather short for a divisional scenario. But <clears throat> one hour is about average for a divisional scenario. And uh, this scenario is basically kind of a part two of the first scenario, which was the Emperor's Plan, which we covered in episode one of, uh, of my Brigade series. And in that scenario, we, com we played one brigade of this division that we're playing uh, in this scenario. We played Bowden's Brigade, and uh, basically our job was just to go into the woods uh, in front of Hugamont and clear them of uh, the Allies inside. Uh, it was an introductory scenario. The main point was just to, you know, kind of teach you how to use skirmishers. Uh, so in this scenario, uh, it starts about a half hour after the first scenario ends. And in that time, uh, Bowden, the commander of uh, Bowden's brigade, has heroically gone and got himself killed in front of the walls of Hugomont. Um, and you know, this is, uh, like the Emperor's Plan, this scenario is uh, one of the more common scenarios that you'll see played on YouTube. And a lot of the time, the players all kind of make the same mistake in both of these scenarios, which is they just end up hurling all their forces at Hugomont itself, at the fort. Um, if you recall in the Emperor's Plan, I said, don't bother attacking the fort. It's completely unnecessary to win that scenario. And the same is true in this scenario. It's completely unnecessary to attack the fort. And you'll see one of the first things I do is uh, pull Bowden's brigade out of the predicament that they've gotten themselves into. Um, but yeah, most of the times that you see people play this scenario on YouTube, you will see uh, them hurling their forces at Hugo Mont. And that's not entirely historically inaccurate. Uh, you know, historically, Hugomont was something of a French death magnet in, in that it just seemed to keep attack, attracting troops toward it. Uh, um, Bonaparte's division here, the 6th Division that we'll be playing, pretty much threw his entire force at the Chateau. Uh, you know, so it's not entirely uh, inaccurate that these players go and do that as, you know, Bonaparte basically did the same thing. Uh, not Napoleon, his his brother, uh, Jerome Bonaparte, commanded the 6th Division of the 2nd Corps. <clears throat> so, uh, while it may be historically accurate to do that, it's not how we're going to win. <laughs> uh, because the fort is just, it's heavily defended, there's a lot of troops in it, and they get reinforcements uh, inside the fort uh, very early on. So it's basically a point sucker. You know, it's you can win the scenario by, uh, you know, leaving Bounds Brigade in front of the fort. They're, you know, they're not going to do well. They're going to they're going to lose uh, more men than they kill. Um, but it's still possible to to win the scenario so long as you don't go and attack the fort with Foy's Brigade as well. But I hate losing points uh, when it's not necessary. Uh, so I pull. I always pull Bowden's Brigade out away from Hugomont. It's just not important um, uh, uh, for winning the scenario. Uh, so I've played the scenario many times, uh, and, uh, you know, for the most part, it always kind of goes down the same way. It's a, it's a very uh, a predictable outcome. Not many things are going to happen here that's going to surprise me. So let's get the video going here. And uh, basically... <clears throat> Uh, it starts at 12.30 p.m., and the situation is that Bowden's Brigade is hotly engaged with the enemy outside of the walls of the Chateau Hougamont. Our forces were able to briefly take that chateau, and blah, 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 blah. You guys can read it. I scrolled through it way too fast. 
but yeah, basically what we have to do is take the allied right, which is a uh, a different objective kind of out towards the uh, the west of Hugomont. Hugomont is an objective and it is worth points, but uh, as I've said before, it's it's just not worth it. You can the objective that we're going for is something like um, 200 points a minute. I'm just going to turn the sound down a little bit here because it'll be a lot louder than my voice if I leave it at maximum volume there. Um, so yeah, it's really not worth it and uh, for to attack the fort. And the, the objective we're going for is worth something like 200 points a minute. If we can capture it quickly, uh, we're going to get all the points we need just from that fort. So uh, here we go. Here is uh, Jerome Bonaparte, our division commander, and he is getting his orders here. It says, It is with great regret that I inform you that Marshal Bowden was killed outside the walls of the Chateau Hugomont. His replacement officer is en route to Bowden's brigade from the southeast. Durlan will be launching his assault soon, so we must take the Allied right to ensure his success. Commit the rest of your division and attack the Allied right. And that is from... Uh, General Ryle, uh, the 2nd Corps commander. Okay, so the first thing I think I'm going to do here is... Uh, basically, I'm going to shimmy Foy's Brigade kind of over to the west to kind of get into a, uh, a better position for the attack here. There's the objective over there. Uh, you can see it we're kind of right in the center of the screen there. And it's very lightly defended. There are only uh, three allied battalions. One of them is out of view right now. They're off to the right. They're kind of in that ditch. Um, so it's very lightly defended at the moment. This is kind of similar to the last scenario that we played in that, uh, it's a lightly held, uh, objective. And if we can take it quickly, we can set up a defensive line and basically be ready to meet the allied reinforcements that are going to try and retake the position. And one of the things I'm going to do is also bring, immediately bring my artillery, uh, kind of over to this area. And they'll be big, basically begin bombarding the uh, the Allied battalions out there. Um, so initially, that's what I'm doing. I'm just kind of sidestepping this uh, boys' brigade to get into a, a position to attack the Allied right. And now I'm going to go over here, and as I said, I'm going to get Bowden's brigade out of here. This is, you know, they're already retreating. You know, smart boys. Um, so this is the uh, the replacement. Louis, I guess his name is. And uh, basically, I'm going to pull them back into the woods, get them away from Hugomont. And after I do that, I will withdraw them to uh, the part of the line that uh, Foy's brigade just uh, vacated. And I'm going to set them up uh, in line because if you don't attack the fort, which I'm not going to, uh, the Allied reinforcements, which are two big British. Uh, guard regiments um, will actually advance right through the fort. If you look at the just beyond the fort there, you can see those two battalions, and they're big. They're huge battalions. Um, there's just two of them. Now. And if you don't attack, the, they're, they're basically heading to reinforce the fort. But if you don't attack the fort, they'll just move right through it and try and attack your line. So you will see me after I pull Bowden back here, I'll have him take up a position between this cavalry artillery battery we're staring at right now and there's another battery kind of on the right and I'll place them in line kind of right between these two batteries and I'll put skirmishers out in front <clears throat> and they'll be ready to defend against those two allied units that are going to move uh, on our position and that's a much better situation than standing there trying to shoot at them in the fort because once those guys get into the fort the They've got damn near 3,000 men in the fort at that point. It's, just, it's very tough to make them run and actually <clears throat> and actually occupy the fort. I have done it, but after so many times of playing this scenario um, and doing all sorts of different strategies and tactics, I've just come to the conclusion that it's just not worth attacking the fort. Uh, you're going to lose just a ton of men and... It's absolutely not worth it. You can get a much higher score in this scenario uh, by doing what I'm going to do. Uh, like I said, the Chateau is just a huge 
French death magnet, and it's just going to siphon off your points uh, very quickly if, you know, you stand there trying to sledgehammer at it. Um, so this is where I'm uh, now going to uh, move uh, now Fluess's brigade. It's really, it's Bowden's brigade still, but Bowden has gone and got uh, himself killed. And I'll set them up in line. I think I move them over a little bit more towards this artillery battery here. And in the meantime, uh, Floyd's brigade here has almost in position. And I'm going to let them sit there just for a couple of minutes after they get in position. Because I really want to get the artillery going uh, to soften up the three allied battalions uh, that are holding that objective. Now, this isn't quite like the last episode in... Uh, um, the Quatre Bras episode that we just did uh, a couple of days ago, uh, in that speed is not necessarily a huge issue here. It isn't like the reinforcements uh, are already on their way. They're deployed back there. You just can't see them uh, because we're not in line of sight. They're deployed back there just sitting there anyway. So they don't start moving to reinforce the allies up here until the allies actually get engaged. Uh, that is, until they actually start engaging in combat. So it isn't like we have to be in a huge rush to actually engage them um, before the, the reinforcements come up. It, they only will start coming up once I actually engage them. It is important once we engage them to be quick. Uh, and you'll see I'm just going to charge the whole brigade at those three battalions and make them break as quickly as possible and then establish a defensive line uh, basically around the objective. And I'll bring the artillery up in the center, and you know I'm going to set up a, a fortress, uh, which is kind of typical of what you'll see me do in later divisional and core scenarios in a lot of situations where I have... Uh, I kind of have, like, I don't know how to describe it. I have, like, go-to formations for certain situations. Um you know, for attack, for defense, um, and one of the things I'll do is take a brigade and put it in line, I'll put artillery in front of the brigade, uh, kind of right in front of the brigade, and then I'll throw skirmishers forward uh, in front of the whole brigade and in front of the artillery. Now, skirmishers don't block artillery's line of sight, which is one of the reasons I do this, um, and it's also kind of a way of, of defending the artillery because uh, one, you'll see in later scenarios, one of the, the computer's favorite things to do is when you get an artillery battery that's in a forward position, it will try and send skirmishers forward to shoot at them. And even though those skirmishers are going to get clipped with canister fire, um, artillery does not tend to stand once they start getting shot at by small arms. They don't stand for very long, even though they, you know, their canister fire is doing devastating damage. Once they are engaged in small arms fire and they actually start losing artillery men, they are so much more prone to retreating and routing uh, than you know, basically at any other time. Uh, so one of the things I do to counter that is put skirmishers in front of the artillery because they don't block line of sight and they have the effect of basically screening the artillery because they're engaging the skirmishers instead of the skirmishers engaging the artillery. Um, so that's kind of one of my go-to defensive formations. And uh, this is all stuff I've just met. I figured out by messing with the game and figuring out how the game's mechanics work and uh, you know, s seeing how the how, how engagements work, what the distances are and so forth like I, I've experimented with a lot of the mechanics of this game to figure out basically what strategies and tactics will work best against the AI now that being said these aren't necessarily tactics or strategies that would work if you were playing say multiplayer against uh, another human because you know another human is gonna you know instantly be able to figure out what it is you're doing and you know, if he's got any brains whatsoever, you know, he's going to he's gonna have a counter to it. And uh, I find when playing, you know, multiplayer, what you're going to end up with is more of what I call combined arms gridlock, 
where you all kind of make the right move uh, and you end up with a situation like in chess where you're, you know, fighting over one square and you have, you know, half your pieces and half the opponent's pieces kind of positioned to attack that one square. And it's just a matter of who's going to blink first. Uh, but the tactics and strategies I've developed here are basically for fighting the AI uh, based on the the tendencies and the tactics that I've seen the AI use. Uh, so right here I'm doing what I always do, and that is basically putting skirmishers out in front of uh, a line, a brigade in line, uh, because they're going to screen that brigade so that the allied battalions, when they form line, they'll be shooting at skirmishers, which are a lot harder to hit, and uh, not really the lines behind them. Uh, so the skirmishers generally will get the better of the exchange with uh, line battalions. And I've talked about this repeatedly. It's probably old news to you guys by now. But um, you know, I just mentioned it again to uh, you know sort of, sort of show the consistency of how that works. And here I've got my artillery set up on my left flank here. And they are in canister range. At least some of the guns are. But I'm actually going to sift the position here just to make sure... I put all the guns in canister range, and basically I'm going to blast away at that uh, that far uh, that far battalion there on the allied right, and basically I'm, I'm going to soften them up with artillery, and you will see kind of right about the time they uh, that I get into position here uh, with uh, Foy's, uh, I'm sorry, Soy's brigade. Why do I keep calling it Foy? Soy's Brigade. Uh, right about the time I get into position here is about the time that that battalion there has had enough of the artillery and they withdraw. So I end up in a situation where I am charging my entire brigade, 3,500 men, uh, at just, you know, two average-sized uh, allied battalions. And they're going to run them off uh, pretty quickly. Uh, but as we crest this ridge, you will see there are actually quite a number of reinforcements um, behind them. So after we drive these three uh, allied battalions kind of off the objective, we have to set up a defensive line kind of as quickly as possible. So uh, as you can see, the skirmishers, you know, they did their job just like always. They... Uh, they made the first uh, Allied Battalion withdraw already. And basically, we're just advancing. As soon as I get into position here, I'm double-clicking them just to get them there. It's not a far, not a far run. It's not really going to hit their fatigue hard. And basically, here we go. Bombs away. And as you can see, the rightmost uh, Allied uh, Battalion has gotten their butt kicked by some canister fire and off they go. Uh, now I wish my uh, my brigade would have split up a little more evenly. I've got 90% you know, of it charging one battalion and I've got one brigade charging the other allied battalion. Uh, so that could have gone badly. Uh, you know, they could have lost that, but they didn't. They actually, you know, they drove them back. Um, it wouldn't have really been a huge big deal if they forced that unit to retreat, because the rest of the brigade, I could have just moved them over and, you know, gotten rid of them very quickly. Um, and that, that could be part of the reason why they chose to withdraw anyway. So as soon as this, that, this melee is over now, and I don't want to go too, too close, I don't want to run them down, because there's a lot of allied artillery back there. And I don't want to get too close to it, because you guys know how I feel about canister fire. I'm just I'm not a fan. Uh, so now it's time to set up the old defensive line. And I'm just putting everybody into line formation. I'm not going to use this formation, because it's just a straight line. And these rightmost units will be too close to the artillery, and they'll start eating canister fire. But I just put them in that formation, and then I'll kind of take uh, each unit and kind of position them, you know, in more in a way I want it to be. And I never have any idea exactly how the line is going to look at the end. I just kind of get a rough outline uh, of kind of what I want, and then as the game goes on, I'll, I'll kind of reshape it. 
And uh, in this scenario, I actually ended up reshaping it quite a bit because um, the Allies do make some vigorous counterattacks, and they're doing it, um, you know, at, at a time when I'm actually trying to get my line still kind of set up the way I want. So I do end up making quite a bit, quite a bit of adjustment to the line itself. So this first unit that we push back um, is reforming, kind of not too far away. So we're going to end up kind of engaging them right away. But we uh, we absolutely have the superiority in numbers uh, right now. And you can see back behind the objective there, there's some artillery. And in front of them is a brigade of uh, allied infantry. And those are the boys that are going to come after us as soon as they get themselves going. I believe it's them. The rightmost uh, Allied Battalion, the one that um, my artillery kind of blasted to bits, they routed and canister fire is devastating. And, uh, you know, that's why I try to stay out of it uh, as much as possible. Uh, and why I try to employ it whenever I can. Uh, so now I'm going to bring the artillery forward and put them in front of uh, the my brigade. I am not deploying them like that. That uh, you know, that's that's terrible. There we go. We'll we'll fix that. Okay. So now I've got them kind of pointed in the general direction, and there you can see the Allied brigade getting on the move there. And I'm going to do my thing, my skirmisher thing that you guys always see me do. Where I put my skirmishers out in front because they will get hit less and they usually end up, you know, inflicting more casualties than they take. Old news by now, but I keep doing it because it keeps working. So what I'm trying to do is get my line set up and my skirmishers out front, uh, kind of before this Allied Brigade that you see approaching from the uh, on the left side of the screen there behind that bush. Uh, you know, before they get here. I can't recall if I actually do, but I do know it's a heated fight for uh, a quick one. They do kind of vigorously counterattack here, trying to take the position back. And really, what I want to do is get the artillery out in front here because when these uh, when these allied units start to move up I am gonna pulverize them with canister fire I mean just just non-stop I actually have to bring my ammo train uh, up, up forward to resupply the art keep the artillery in ammo because we just burn through canister so quickly So luckily the Allied Brigade has halted here for a second. I don't know if, uh, how long they take to get going, I don't recall. I was too busy trying to get myself set up here. <coughs> but it wasn't for long. Here they come. Uh, and here comes my artillery. Eight big guns. And, you know, the real key to putting artillery out in front here is to protect them. Put skirmishers out in front and put... Uh, regular line units uh, on their flanks uh, so that they can if uh, if an allied unit chooses to charge they'll charge the skirmishers the skirmishers will retreat and then you counter charge with your battalions that you have on the guns flank so the real key is to protect the guns from being shot at protect the guns from being charged especially by infantry because uh, if they're charged by infantry, they get captured, and then they would be turned into allied infantry. Uh, I'm sorry, allied artillery, and then they would just, you know, start bombing away on us. So while it's very effective to put artillery out front in terms of the, the, the damage you're going to deal, you really got to protect it, and you really got to make sure that it doesn't get taken by the enemy, because that'll just mess you up 
you just you don't want to lose your artillery, and more than that, you don't want it to be captured and turned on you. Uh, so you'll see I, I go to great pains uh, to protect my artillery. So the guns are moving into position, and I have skirmishers on the flank right now, and I'm sort of just waiting to see how the situation develops. Uh, this one allied unit on the uh, on my right flank there, I'm not worried about them. It's one battalion. They've already been charged and retreated, and they're just, you know, they're going to lose to these skirmisher units. So I'm not really concerned at them at all. But as you can see, quite a lot of troops coming at us. Um, but the guns are unlimbering, and they are about to catch Holy Hell. Now, they are sending a skirmisher unit out in front, which is a smart move. Um, but I've, it's one I've seen from the AI many times before. Or I know what they're going to do, so I'm going to move my skirmishers out to engage them. You know, this is this is what they do. They they when you unlimber artillery, they're going to send skirmishers forward to try and shoot at the artillery. As you can see, I'm, my one skirmish unit is catching a little bit of canister fire from one gun over there in the hedgerows on the right side of the screen. Um, but they're not going to have to. It's only one gun, and they're not going to take it for long. My artillery is about to unleash some hell. So I'll quickly kind of move the skirmisher unit that's kind of in range right now, and I'll move them in front of the guns. And uh, I'm basically waiting to see what it is the Allies are going to do, where they're going to attack. It's not a smart move to attack directly uh, in front of artillery, because you're just going to catch holy hell. Uh, as you come up. So I'm waiting to see if they're going to move off to the right or off to the left. And, you know, once I kind of have a feel for where their attack is going to focus on, I'll start moving my, my line battalions to counter that. But for right now, uh, I'm, as you can see, the canister fire is just devastating. I'm just blasting away with this huge mass of men. And I'm now moving my skirmishers into the center because it seems like they're coming at the center. And as I said, skirmishers don't block my artillery's line of sight, so it's it's a great tactic to put skirmishers in front of artillery because they screen the artillery from being fired on by small arms, and they don't block line of sight, so the artillery just keeps bombing away like this. And uh, this is why I'm a huge fan of artillery, and especially using it this way. Um, I've mentioned before in Scourge of War that artillery isn't so effective at, you know, medium to long ranges. Um, especially long ranges, especially darkness. But up close like this, it is ridiculous. You know, the main thing is if you're going to use it up close like this, be ready to protect it. And as you can see, uh, an allied unit is actually moving forward in assault column. And that can only mean one thing. They're going to charge. But they're going to charge my skirmishers. And my skirmishers will fall back when they're charged. And I will counter charge them with the, this unit right here. And here they go. Charge. I'm going to counter charge them. The skirmishers will retreat. They don't get near the guns. They since they charged the skirmishers and the skirmishers retreated, they just stop and reform. And I get to charge right into them. So I've protected my guns. I've countercharged this allied battalion. It kind of worked out pretty much exactly, you know, the way I wanted it to. And as soon as this is over, like I said, I'm not on the attack yet. This was a countercharge. It was meant to stop them from getting near the guns, uh, you know. So I'm content to just have them run off. I'm not going to... And they actually surrender. Uh, and, and as soon as that happens, I'm content to pull this battalion back, and I will move the skirmishers back into position. Uh, so that pretty much, you know, work, yeah, that couldn't have worked out any better. It's all about timing. You know, wait and see what they're going to do, and once you know what they're going to do, you know, you're able to you know, counter what they're going to do. And it's, it's, it's all about bringing more types of different arms to bear um, than the enemy can. So we're using skirmishers, we're using artillery, and we've got line infantry.
country. Uh, so, you know, kind of anything they do uh, in a in kind of forward attack like that, I've seen it before, and I kind of know what it is they're going to do. And I've just developed ways to, to counter that. So they're retreating, and I've, pulled, I've put the skirmishers back in position, and you can see another column is coming on the right side now. And I have skirmishers in front of the artillery, screening the artillery, and I'm going to pull the same trick again, basically. I'm going to take a, a an infantry unit and put them in assault column. And... Uh, this unit approaching, this allied unit approaching, I really, really catches hell from the artillery. I'm not sure if I actually even have to charge them. Um, they might break before they even get a chance to charge, because they're getting fired on with canister fire, they're getting fired on by the skirmishers. But they are pretty close. Uh, it looks like I just decide to charge them and make sure nothing happens. You know, and it's almost a guarantee I'm going to win all these charges because these units that are coming up are taking such a beating from the canister and the skirmishers. They're losing a lot of men, their morale's getting hit hard. So, you know, I'm just in a position where I charge. I'm, I'm pretty confident that I'm going to win every single one of them. And there they go. And again, I'm not after uh, pursuing them here. This, uh, this is not a situation where I'm really on the attack. Uh, it's one of those cases of the best defense being a good offense. I'm breaking up their attack before they really have a chance to get it going. Um, and just continuing to pound away on them with artillery. All the while, you can see, uh, I, I'm, I have the objective, and I'm sitting here just racking up points. It's like 200 points a minute. Um, and there we go. We're just pulling our unit back. back in the, And I'm going to leave them there, actually, in case uh, the uh, allies approach again. I can do the same thing. Having artillery in the center like this is, is just great, because you just do unbelievable damage. Uh, you know, this is an eight-gun battery, it's a lot of firepower, and up close like this, just, you know, any time an allied unit approaches, you're going to get to blast them with canister. You know, and as long as you protect them, as long as you keep skirmishers out there, as long as you keep units on their flanks, and, you know, and really guard them, <laughs> they will deliver the goods. You know, and, and this unit, this artillery battery delivered the goods so well that you know, as I said later on, you'll see me actually bring, you know, go looking for my uh, my uh, uh, supply wagon and bring them up. Now, this unit, this you see, this one of these our guns are falling back here, and they're actually falling back because they're out of ammunition, uh, they're out of canister. You know, they so. Uh, I actually will bring that gun back up, and that's kind of, kind of when I realize, oh, I have I have shot so much canister since the scenario started that I'm some of my guns are now starting to run out of ammunition. As you can see, all they have is shell. They have 108 rounds of that, but they've they've shot all their canister. So here I go. Where is my supply leg? No, that's not mine. Where is it? Oh, it's all the way back by Bowden's Brigade. So that's Bonaparte. That's our division commander. He's just hanging out there. What we really want is the supply wagon. So I'm going to take command of it and just kind of bring it right up to the artillery caissons. And we'll double quick them because uh, wagons don't have fatigue. You can, you know, officers and wagons, you can double quick them as much as you want and they'll never get tired because uh, they don't have a fatigue level. So I'm just clicking use roads because they move a little faster on the roads. And they'll get here quicker. So that gun that is out of ammo, they'll just sit there. Um, 
or, or you know, now that there's no enemy in canister range, they might just start shooting their uh, their shell, which they have uh, a lot of ammo of. And then once the supply wagons come up, I'll just run them kind of back and forth between the uh, all the uh, artillery caissons, and you'll see their supply numbers uh, drop as they go by each caisson with, uh, and resupply them. So I'm uh, what I'm doing here is I've moved the two skirmisher units on the left kind of forward of the art to kind of be in line with the skirmishers that are in front of the artillery. And uh, I'm going to move um, uh, the three battalions I have over there and basically set up a, a, a formation I learned from the KS mod, which would be to have lines in front and then column assault columns. Uh, behind the two lines in front. And all I'm doing here is just clicking on units and, and kind of checking their log, because they are being bombed on by that artillery over there. I'm just, I'm just making sure they're not getting hit really hard. And they have taken a few losses, so I'm going to try backing them off a little bit. Um, in the end, I just decide that this entire right flank thing that I have going on over there um, is basically pointless. Uh, there's nobody that's going to attack me from over there. And, you know, it's just kind of a habit I have of, of setting units up in a, a, a semicircle to kind of refuse flanks a little bit. Uh, but it just turned out to not be necessary uh, here. Uh, so I ended up uh, moving them to kind of occupy uh, the rear of the line behind the artillery, just in case they were needed. And I just kind of laid them down. And I don't spend too much time over here. All I'm doing is making sure that these guys aren't getting bombed down by anything, that they're you know not taking losses. They've already turned back the uh, the two allied battalions. You can see them kind of facing their backs to us near the woods there, and I have no real interest in going after them. Um, even if I just made them run away more, what would be the point? You know, as long as they're sitting there, they're not doing anybody any harm. So this is what I call the breather period. The Allies have made their counterattack, they got their butts kicked, and what they're basically doing now is pulling their units back and, and, and letting them rally. Uh, you can see they've got some of their officers near their forward units. Uh, so the unit's morale recovers, the unit's fatigue recovers, and you know they'll you know, give it another shot in a little while here. Uh, but their second attempt is nowhere near as forceful as that first attempt was. Uh, and the artillery kind of just handles it for me. I don't really have to do too much. Uh, in all honesty, uh, that's pretty much, you know, it for the exciting part of the scenario. Uh, as you see, we're only... Uh, we're only about a half hour into the scenario, and I've got the objective. I've decimated the uh, Allied forces near this objective. Um, and we're sitting here racking up huge amounts of points. I think we're at like 4,000 points or something, way more than we need for uh, a major victory. And this is why I say there's absolutely no reason to attack the fort. You're going to get an absurd amount of points from this objective as long as you capture it quickly. Uh, it's 200 points a minute, so if you capture it within the first half hour like I did, you're just going to rack up enormous amounts of points. Um, so there's really no reason to go after the fort. And um, I could bring, you know... Bowden's Brigade up here to reinforce this position, but it's it's not necessary and I like them where they are because uh, you know, as long as they're there, those two allied battalions sitting in front of the woods are not going to do anything because there's artillery on the flanks of, on both flanks of Bowden's Brigade. It's a really good position and they've got skirmishers out in front of them. They're not, they're not going to bother making a second attempt at that. You know, and this position is good. It's on a high ridge. I have a good field of fire with my artillery. It uh, 
you know, it makes them really hard to uh, for the allies to approach and, and not get decimated by canister fire as they're coming up. And as you can see, I'm just kind of zigzagging my supply wagon kind of along the rear of the artillery battery and resupply. They resupply each uh, each caisson as they go by. So I'm, li I'm laying those two battalions down just to kind of take cover from the uh, from the artillery. I don't worry too much about skirmishers. It's very hard for artillery to hit skirmishers uh, at this range. So we've got 4,200 points so far. And as I mentioned before, it's always good to bring the highest ranking officer that you control to occupy the objective, which is why I'm bringing Jerome Bonaparte to the objective. Because now he will get the points instead of uh, Foy, and it just works out to a higher point total for the whole division. Um, and there are certain morale bonuses and stuff that go along with uh, occupying uh, an objective. And the higher the officer, the higher rank of the officer, the more units under that officer's control, the more units get the benefit of having uh, those bonuses from, from the objective. But I never do that until I'm certain I have the position secure, because Bonaparte is who we are in the game. That's who, the, you know, the character we play. Uh, so if he gets killed, that's the end of the scenario. You lose. You get a tragedy. On the, uh, the little newspaper. Now, as you can see, by using some, moving some of these units forward, I have lost the objective because while I have the officers there, I no longer have enough men within range of the objective. And uh, what I do is basically move the two units I have lying down. On. This is where I decide that defending the right flank is just completely unnecessary, and I move those two units to occupy the objective. I, I don't know if I necessarily rush to do it. I already have enough points to win the scenario, so, you know, I don't care that much that I no longer have possession of the objective, and I'll get it back in a minute anyway. So I'm just moving these line units right up behind the skirmishers to add firepower if and when uh, I get engaged, and I will move this assault column right up behind them, and as I said, that's uh, uh, the double line formation from the KS mod, uh, and I like that formation uh, because it has a counter. It basically has a built-in counterattack behind the line infantry. Uh, so I tend to, if I, you know, once I get my line set up, sometimes I, I use that <clears throat> if I think I'm going to be facing, uh, you know, counterattacks, and I may and I may have to countercharge those counterattacks. So the Allies have rested up a little bit, and they're getting ready to make another go at it. Uh, as you can see, I've retaken the objective because I've moved units within range now. And I'm just kind of closing up the right side here a little bit. It, uh, you know, it's not, there's nobody that's going to attack me from there. I'm just kind of holding it with a couple of skirmisher units. And as, as, as I said, the second Allied attack is not nearly as forceful as the first one because these units are... You know, even though they've recovered a little bit, they're they're you know they're not as fresh as they were at the beginning. So, you know, a couple of a couple of grape shots of that canister, and uh, you know, they think better of it. You know, this is this is a hard position to assault now. At this point, I've kind of turned this into a fortress. Um, you know, they would need a, a lot of men, and they'd need to come at me all at once to try and overrun this position. And they just, as you can see by all the allied bodies lying on the ground there, there's just not that many of them left. Um, yes, let's make our let's make our line look nice and neat. These are the things I do when I have nothing better to do. Make everything look pretty. <laughs> uh, because at this point, uh, the scenario is pretty much in the bag. There isn't much more for me to do. I've taken the objective. I, I am certainly not going to be pushed off of it at this point. You know, with the guns right there in the center and my skirmishers all over the place. Uh, nevertheless, here they come. They're going to try and uh, make another go of this. But this, you know, 
my artillery's been resupplied at this point, and you know they're they're going to get pounded on as they come up. Not to mention the skirmishers have already engaged them. You know, and, and I think there are only so many units available to the AI to actually use in this scenario. Um, they have a whole bunch of artillery back there, and uh, they never bring it up. I mean, way more artillery than I've got. All I've got is eight guns. They've got, you know, Christ, 30 guns back there. You know, if they cons if they repositioned those guns and concentrated them on me, you know, they would blow me to pieces. But I think the scenario is just kind of scripted so that I'm just dealing with the Allied infantry here. And those guns never really make a move to reposition. Likewise, they have a lot of cavalry back there. And uh, I have no cavalry. Uh, you know, Kellerman, I think it's Kellerman's cavalry, is back there. But, um, you know, I don't have control of them. You know, so here they go. They're trying to make their second push here. And as I said, it's, it's not going to come anywhere near as close to being uh, as threatening as the first attack was because none of these units are fresh anymore and uh, they're going to get pulverized by uh, canister fire as they come up here. And my skirmishers are already engaging them. You can see one unit back there already running away. And already one unit is breaking. One unit is stopped and is kind of moving into line. And all that's really coming at me now is... Uh, and they've all turned around too. So as I said, didn't really amount to much. They just... They're not, too, they're not really fresh enough anymore to, to, to come at a position like this. You know, eight guns blasting away with canister fire and very well protected. And that is the key to using artillery in this manner. If you're going to bring artillery forward and use them for their close range damage, you really have to protect the hell out of them. Because they're very, very vulnerable. Um, to close range small arms fire. Once once close range uh, small arms start shooting at artillery and killing the gunners, um, it doesn't take long at all for the guns to rout. Likewise, they're you know they they can't melee at all if they get charged. They're just you know they're instant capture. But when you protect them, and there's no way for the uh, the enemy forces to get near them and shoot at them or charge them and they're basically stuck in front here like this you know you can see uh, canister fire just blasting into this allied battalion in front and there's nothing they can do about it if they try to approach if they try to approach they're going to eat more canister fire they're getting shot at by skirmishers and they're going to get charged by these units that I have on the artillery's flanks so, you know, one battalion here is just not going to cut. And especially this, just standing here trying to, you know, trade shots with my forces. Um, there's no way in hell they're, they're going to win this. And as you can see, there they go. You know, it just, that's, that's just not the way to do it. Now, if I were in charge of the Allies in this situation, and if I had control over every unit on the map here, it would be a different story. Because I would be able to concentrate artillery fire from two different angles. I have batteries over here that I would that are doing nothing right now. What are they doing? They're shooting at, you know, my main line, you know, a half a mile away, you know, they're absolutely doing no good at all, and I would turn them uh, on this, these forces here, and I would bring those other guns right there in the center 
I would bring them forward and I would start pounding away on my line. Uh, I would bring up the cavalry I have over there and force these units into square. The skirmishers would have to fall back because skirmishers are like oats to those horses. They just they just feed them. <laughs> <clears throat> the skirmishers would just tr uh, get trampled by the uh, by the uh, cavalry. So I would either have to reabsorb them back into the battalions or pull them back. And then once those units are in square, I would bring the in the whatever allied infantry I have left forward and shoot at the squares uh, with uh, line infantry and uh, artillery. Artillery pound squares. But alas, you know, that's not the situation I'm in. I command the French, not the, uh, not the allies. So, you know, they're not going to do that. I, I suspect that, that, that those units are not really available in this scenario, and, and that's why the AI isn't doing anything with them. Um, or they're just scripted to not engage until enemy units come within range of them. And I have no intention of doing that. I have what I'm here for. You know, I have the objective. And as you can see, um, we're at 7,000 points, which is way more than what we actually need for a major victory. We need 2,000 2,000 or 2,500 points for a major victory. So, uh, by pulling Bowden away from Hugamont, uh, I basically eliminated that constant siphoning of points uh, that would happen by Bowden's brigade being in that kind of no-win situation where they're constantly going to lose more men uh, than, they, than they kill. Uh, which is why I say, don't bother attacking the fort. It's just a point sucker. Um, you know, attack this position quickly, bring your artillery up, and, you know, solidify your hold on it, and you're going to rack up just an absurd amount of points. Now, now, some of this is not just the objective. It's it's the battery. The artillery battery has racked up something like a 1,000 points itself, and that's just because of the huge damage canister fire does. Uh, but a lot of it is the objective. You know, like I said, 200 points a minute is a lot. Uh, and I actually believe that this is pretty much it uh, for the scenario. There is pretty much nothing more to do. Uh, the Allies are spent. Uh, I don't believe they make any further uh, advance on my position. So all you're really going to see for the rest of this... Uh, scenario is basically just the guns, my guns shooting, their guns shooting, and nothing else really happening. In fact, I'm not even here when I'm playing this. You can see the camera's not moving right now. I wasn't even here. I was I was off in the living room looking at the computer. I knew the scenario was over. <laughs> um, you know, I come back once in a while just to look around, but uh, well, I just kind of left the video running <clears throat> while I uh, was uh, doing my thing. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. The scenario goes to 13.30, so we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, but that's basically the end of the scenario. We're just going to sit here, shooting our guns, um, racking up our points, and I think we end somewhere with, like, 10,000 points, which is way, way, way more than we actually need. And the reason we got that high is because we just didn't have the bleeding point deficit of leaving Bowden's Brigade where they started off initially in the scenario, which was shooting at the fort. Um, you know, which, if we had done that, our score would have been uh, a lot lower. Uh, we still would have gotten enough for a major victory, uh, but it would be a lot lower, lower because there'd be just a constant draining of points by Bowden's Brigade, uh, you know, losing men in front of the fort. <clears throat> So, if you want a really stupid, absurd high score, and, I mean, that doesn't really matter, because, you know, there's nothing higher than a major victory. There's no awesome victory or ultimate victory. It's just major victory, and all you need is 2,500 points to get it. So, it doesn't really matter. And here I just brought up the map to actually show you that, yeah, you need 500 men in a 100-yard radius, and it's 200 points per minute. And I just hovered over that objective uh, to show you that. Um, that's pretty much the only reason I brought up the map, is just to make sure I got that on the video. 
but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Uh, I don't know that I really even have much more to say on this. Uh, it's pretty much over. Um, nothing else is going to happen. So, um, I, uh, I guess uh, I'll just let the video run uh, to the end. Um, as I said, there's, uh, there's only about 13 minutes left in this scenario, and I'll just let it run and you guys can, you know, either watch the rest of it, which is just, you know, not much. Nothing really happens. Or you can skip to the end to see the victory screen. And uh, that's pretty much the end of the scenario. Um, I haven't really given much thought to what scenario I'm going to cover next. Uh, I did this one because I wanted to do a Waterloo scenario for, obviously, for the 200th uh, anniversary, which is today. Um, but I think after this, we'll go back and do the... Uh, other divisional scenario from Katra Bra, which is uh, basically the same scenario we played uh, in the last episode, where we played as the French, but this time we're going to play that same scenario uh, from the Allied side. Um, it's kind of the same scenario, but it also includes aspects of um, Marshal Ney's attack on Katra Bra, as well as defending against uh, Bachelor's division that we uh, played in the French version. So it's a little bit bigger. It's also much harder, uh, at, especially at the beginning, uh, because um, Picton's division uh, is kind of... Um, they've been drawn forward a little too far from uh, where they should be, and uh, now they're kind of spread thin, and the French are attacking, and they have cavalry, and we don't, which is always a problem, because, you know, you basically are going to get stuck in square. A lot of a lot of stuck in square formation, uh, because the cavalry will keep approaching, putting you into square, while the, uh, the infantry will, you know, shoot you down, while, you know, you're only presenting 25% of your fire at them, and they're presenting 100% of their fire at you. So uh, it's a tricky balance there, especially at the very beginning of the scenario. So I think we're going to do that one next, and that's called Picton's Rascals, and it's the Allied Divisional Scenario. And that'll be it for the Divisional Scenarios for Katra Bra. And uh, then after that, I guess we'll co probably come back to Waterloo. But most of the Divisional Scenarios in this game are... Uh, in Waterloo, or maybe there's you know there's one in Wavre too. There's the Prussian defense of uh, of uh, the forward area of Wavre. We might do that one. That's a fun one. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. So I'll let the video run, guys, and uh, when it's over, uh, you know maybe I'll stop in and, and say hi. <laughs> All right, guys.
All right, guys, so uh, this is the last minute of the scenario. Um, as I said, very little happened. Uh, you know, pretty much uh, everything that was going to happen, you know, has already happened. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, as you can see, we scored a huge amount of points, like 10,000 points. And uh, that's basically because we captured the objective so early in the scenario. And also because we pulled Bowden's brigade uh, away from Hugo Mont, so he would constantly be uh, a source of bleeding points uh, for us. And um, it may seem like I made this look easy, but uh, I, I should point out I have played this scenario so many times, um, and you know I've you know just over the the you know, many different times that I've played this scenario, um, you know, I've developed uh, the tactics to beat it. Um, and believe me, it wasn't always that way. <laughs> when I first started playing this game, I lost the scenario terribly, probably like, like everyone else does. Um, it took a lot of uh, experimentation and trying and retrying and doing different things before uh, I finally, uh, you know, came up with uh, a way to beat it and it, it also takes a certain amount of practice in in just handling large bodies of troops and you know actually making them you know do what you want them to do um you, you know a lot of people get confused by uh you know the way the ai works and you know a lot of people don't understand that if you move a, a brigade into engage distance with the enemy and you have them uh, on under the AI control, as soon as they move into engage distance, they're going to start doing their own thing. And pretty much any commands you give to them are more like suggestions, um, and they'll choose to ignore them a lot of time. Uh, so I'm just going to pause this real quick while I talk about this. So, you know, if you absolutely want... Um, you know, uh, a unit or a brigade uh, to, to do something very specific. I always advise taking charge of um, the units uh, to do that. Uh, one of the things you see me use a lot in the toolbar is the um, take command of all subordinates button and the uh, deactivate the take command of all subordinates because it's a really quick way to switch between AI control for all your units and your control. So if I want a division to move forward in assault column and get very close to the enemy, like you saw me do in at the very beginning of the scenario where I had Soy's brigade, uh, ch you know, charge en masse, um, you know, the, the allies uh, on the objective. Um, if I had just taken command of, say, the officer and done that, and not the units. As soon as they moved into engage distance, you would have seen them deploy into line and start shooting and wandering off and doing um, their own thing. And uh, that's because while I had the brigade commander under take charge, the units weren't, you know. So the way I get them very close is to just set their destination with the brigade commander on take charge and all the units off of take charge. And then as soon as the destination is set, I put them all on take charge because you're disabling the AI and they'll follow the last order given. And um, that way they'll just, you know, regardless of casualties, regardless of threats, regardless of anything, they will move to that position. And then when I want to charge the whole brigade, I'll immediately take everybody off take charge, retake command of the officer, and just charge the whole brigade. Uh, so, you know, learning how the AI works and when to use it and when not to use it um, is kind of a big key to handling large numbers of troops, especially after they've come into engaged distance of the enemy. It doesn't matter at all uh, whether your units are under AI control or they're under your control when you're not engaged in in combat you, you can just leave them on ai control and they'll still follow your orders because there's nothing they're not going to come within range of any uh as long as they don't come within range of any enemies there's nothing to to, to make them not follow your orders
orders. They only won't follow your orders if they're under AI control and they're all engaging in combat because they're then the AI is handling them. And when you like click on a, a unit that's under um, AI control and say you want it to move somewhere, it's more like a suggestion. You're more like saying, hey, this is what I want you to do, but you know, I really don't have any control of what you're doing. So more often than not, they might start to try to move there, but something else will catch their attention. An enemy unit will, you know, they'll come under fire and they'll just stop and, you know, engage the threat that's, that's closest to them. Um, you know, so it takes a little bit of practice to really understand how the AI works, when to use it and when not to use it. And, um, you know, that's probably the hardest part of handling large bodies of troops. Um, and kind of once you get the hang of that, then then these scenarios become uh, a, a little bit easier, um, you know, because you're becoming more accustomed to handling uh, large numbers of troops. Um, so while I, like I said, while I may have made this look incredibly easy, um, you know, I played the scenario many, many, many times to get to that point. I lost the scenario many times when I first started playing this game. I didn't know what I was doing. My units would go wandering off. I didn't understand why. Uh, you know, I thought the AI was making terrible decisions when really I was just leading them into terrible decisions because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, you know, so, you know, don't don't get discouraged if you play the scenario and it's, you know, if you're new to the game and you get absolutely wrecked, you know, don't let it discourage you because believe me, I got absolutely destroyed when I first started playing um, these games. You know, it, it takes a lot of practice to learn how to handle large numbers of troops in conjunction with the AI, because the, the larger number of troops you handle, the more you have to delegate to the AI. Like you saw in the brigade scenarios in, you know, I, uh, I rarely ever uh, use the AI at all. I pretty much took control of every single unit and control them myself all the time um, because there just aren't that many units to control. And, you know, it's just easy to handle them all yourself. Uh, now we're into divisional scenarios, which aren't that much bigger. It may seem bigger at first, but really it's like just handling two brigade scenarios at once. Instead of playing one brigade, you're playing two. Um, so it's not that big a jump. It's not like in the, the old Scourge of War Gettysburg game where if you played a Confederate division, that was a big difference between playing a, a brigade and a division because some Confederate divisions had, you know, six or seven brigades in them. Uh, and, you know, that's a lot to handle. Uh, <clears throat> but in, in this game, a division is basically most of the time uh, two brigades and uh, an attached artillery battery, which is what we had here. We had Soy's Brigade, Bowden's Brigade and the, the eight guns. So think of it kind of as, uh, you know, <clears throat> playing two brigade scenarios at once, you know. Um, you know, and when you think of it that way, it's suddenly not as, as overwhelming as it may seem, um, you know, at first. In fact, I play them like that. I usually play them as, um, you know, just handling two brigades uh uh, independently you see r rarely do i ever do anything with the division commander except uh you know at the you know end of the scenario once i have the objectives on lock you know and, I, and i'm not worried about getting my division commander killed i'll bring him forward to occupy the objective but other than that i pretty much command uh you know from the brigade commander's point of view and i just kind of bounce back and forth between the uh the two brigade commanders so I'm basically playing these divisional scenarios like they're just two brigade scenarios in one, um, you know, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to do um, these, the series starting from the beginning of, you know, the, the easiest scenarios, you know, the brigade scenarios, and then moving through slightly harder scenarios like the division and then core and army, because as you get comfortable with each level of command, um, it makes it easier to transition to a higher level uh, of command. And, um, you know, when you see uh, me play core scenarios, uh, it'll kind of be the same thing. Instead of, um, you know, it being a division scenario, most cores are, you know, like two divisions. So I'll treat it like playing, you know, 
two divisional scenarios at once, kind of the same thing. And I rarely use uh, the core commander. I use the divisional commanders a, a little more in core commander. But, you know, by the time we get to core commands, you will have played, hopefully, you know, pretty much every divisional scenario. And you'll be much more comfortable at handling divisions. So handling one more division at the same time uh, won't be, you know, such a big deal. Um, but, uh, yeah, so like I said, you know, don't don't get discouraged if you play a scenario like this and get utterly crushed at the beginning. Um, yeah, because it takes time to actually really get a hold on the mechanics, um, how to swiftly use the toolbar, how to... Uh, go back and forth between AI control and your control very quickly. And, um, you know, it just takes practice. You know, it'll, it'll, it'll come to you the more you do it. You know, it's not like I'm some special gamer that I have, uh, uh, you know, some special ability to play this game that, that others don't. I've just spent a lot of time with it. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, if, if, you know, new players, you know, stick to it and, and, you know, get to know the system, it'll become just as easy, uh, you know, for them as uh, it was here for me. And like I said, this wasn't always easy for me. I put in a lot of time to actually uh, develop the tactics that I used to, to beat this scenario. And uh, it didn't happen all at once. It was little by little that I figured out certain things, you know. I can remember when I used to do just leave Bowden's brigade there shooting at the at the fort the whole time because it just didn't seem to matter as far as getting the objective and um you know i would still be able to win the scenario but uh you know Bowden's brigade sitting there getting shot up just serves no purpose at all and you know when i finally realized let me just pull him back out out, out of there and uh you know that'll i'll stop hemorrhaging points um you know, likewise, it took a lot of experimentation with, I can't tell you how many times I have bought that artillery battery uh, up front and gotten them overrun because I didn't know how to protect them. Um, you know, I didn't know how to put skirmishers in front of them to, to slow the advance of the allies. I didn't know to move infantry onto the artillery's flanks to, um, to protect them. You know, I have played the scenario so many times where I brought that battery up front and got them, you know, all captured, all massacred. And, uh, you know, because I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, so yeah, it just takes time and experimentation. And, uh, you know, if you stick with it, you'll start to get better at it. So, uh, I think that's it for this video. And I think we'll go back to Katra Bra for the next episode and do Picton's Rascals. Um, that's a fun scenario. It's, uh, a little tricky, one of the more difficult division, uh, divisional scenarios. It's not the most difficult divisional scenario in the game. I will save you the trouble right now and tell you what the most difficult divisional scenario in this game is, and it is absolutely the uh, final French Imperial Guard assault uh, at Waterloo, the uh, kind of desperate assault by Napoleon to crack Wellington Center and end the battle. Um, Napoleon really had no idea what was behind that ridge because Wellington had basically abandoned his position on the left. The Prussians had come in at that point and, uh, you know, they were kind of occupying that position and that let Wellington basically bring all those troops he had over on the left, uh, and basically concentrate his whole force, uh, in the center. Uh, and, uh, you don't have anywhere near the amount of troops he does. <laughs> so that is a very, very hard scenario to beat. Uh, I can't even, I have gotten it. I have beaten it. I have gotten a major victory, but I will in no way guarantee that I will when we come to that scenario. I, I just can't because it could take me, you know, 10 tries <laughs> before I get a major victory again in that scenario. It is very, very difficult and requires a lot of luck. Um, in getting the right combat results and actually getting the um, just huge amount of allied forces to break. So believe me, I'm going to put that, that one off for a long time. That will probably be the, the last divisional scenario we do. And in no way will I guarantee that I will get a major victory in, in, in that scenario. It is by far the most difficult divisional scenario in the game. It might be the most difficult scenario overall in the game. Um, because you're just at such a huge disadvantage. So, yeah, now I've saved you the time of trying to wonder which one is the most difficult. It is uh, 
it is definitely the final French Imperial Guard assault on Wellington Center at Waterloo. Um, so we're going to do Picton Rascals at Quatre Bras next, and um, that'll probably be in a couple of days. So that's it for now, guys.